Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 94, The Senate vs. Scipio Africanus. With the peace of Apamea agreed upon by nearly all involved parties, the war with Antiochus III was now over. In an ideal world, the Republic would have packed up operations and returned immediately to Italy, with plenty of plunder in tow. However, the transition of a post-Seleucid Asia Minor was a bit more complicated than they would have liked. They also had unfinished business in places like Greece, with the Aetolian League still actively resisting talks with the Republic. Yet by the end of the 180s, some of the most important figures of the time would see their careers come to an end, ushering a new era of history, with the Romans poised as the dominant power of the Mediterranean world. Rome's victory over Antiochus III was remarkably decisive, and as per the terms of the treaty, it demanded that he evacuate all of his garrisons from Asia Minor and be sequestered to the south of the Taurus Mountains. Like with Greece following the Second Macedonian War, The Republic, in turn, did not claim any territories for itself, but was now left with the task of reorganization to ensure that some sort of stable equilibrium was left behind. During the negotiations of the treaty with Antiochus, another commission of ten legates was dispatched to Asia to hear out the various communities' petitions. The Republic gave generously to its two most important allies, Eumenes II of Pergamon and the city-state of Rhodes. Rhodes received the southwestern territories of Lycia and Caria, while Eumenes got the lion's share of everything else. This also meant that all tribute formerly being paid to Antiochus was now being delivered to the Pergamon king. It seems that the Republic intended to have Pergamon and Rhodes act in their stead, keeping guard against any sources of instability while they retired back to Italy. The later Pontic king Mithridates VI is said to have mockingly characterized Eumenes as Rome's custodian, but the Adelaide ruler profited handsomely from the alliance. Letters from Eumenes to the settlement of Tyrion and Phrygia, recently acquired from Antiochus, points to his relationship with the Romans as part of his legitimate claims over the territory. Eumenes would, as we will see, continue to aggressively use his connections with the Republic to try and manipulate the affairs of Asia Minor for the next two decades. There were, of course, other powers to contend with. Ariarathes IV of Cappadocia was welcomed into Roman arms after his assistance of the Seleucids, following a payment of 600 talents. This indemnity was reduced by half following the intervention of Eumenes, who was marrying Ariarathes' daughter. Prusias I of Bithynia politely refrained from interfering with the Roman crossing into Asia on the Scipio's urging. On the northern coastline of Anatolia, Heraclia Pontica sent out representatives that agreed to a friendship with the Republic, as did Kibera and Lycia to the south. None of these powers especially liked each other, and soon there would be a breakdown of relations, especially with the increased prestige and strength of Eumenes. Even among Rome's allies, Rhodes and Pergamon shared a mutual enmity given their competition for trade, thus potentially checking each other's growth. With the situation in Asia to their liking, the Republic honored its word in order that all troops return to Europe by the end of 188. This isn't to say that the exit was entirely smooth. During their wars in the east, the Republic fought with Celtic tribes on a few occasions. The number of Celts that allied with Hannibal Barca during the Second Punic War led to retaliatory strikes further into the Po Valley throughout the 190s and early 180s, solidifying Roman control of an area that had been in a state of flux for many centuries. Peoples like the Boii and Insubris were defeated outright, while others like the Kenomani chose to submit rather than risk being displaced. A similar phenomenon occurred in Asia Minor during the end of the Antiochene War. Gnaeus Manlius Vulso, the incoming consul for 189, arrived in Ephesus in March to take over from Scipio Asiaticus. He was originally tasked with overseeing the completion of the treaty with Antiochus, but in his mind, there was little glory to be gained from negotiating peace from an already defeated enemy. Since the Seleucids were no longer a threat, a new target needed to be found, which led the consul to turn towards Galatia. Antiochus recruited many Galatian warriors to serve in his army against Rome, thereby making most of the tribes complicit in the eyes of the ambitious commander. 
Volso also argued that the Galatians' combative nature would create chaos in the vacuum following the evacuation of the Seleucids, and they had not given any signs of respecting the peace of Apamea. Rome's tumultuous history with the Celtic people did not lend much in the way for sympathy either, and the consul had little trouble igniting the enthusiasm of his soldiers. However, it is absolutely clear that he did not gain the authorization of the Roman Senate before making his decision to begin this campaign. Before he set out into enemy territory, Vulso called upon the Kingdom of Pergamon to furnish assistance and guides. With Eumenes in Rome at the time, his brother Attalus answered the request by arriving with 1,000 infantry and 300 cavalry. The Attalids had long championed themselves as defenders of the Greeks against the Gallic menace, so they were enthusiastic about the expedition. Supplies were taken from Prince Seleucus, who was en route to deliver a grain payment to Rome from the city of Antioch in Pisidia, but was intercepted by Vulso. This army marched first to Pamphylia to the east, then turned north into the heartland of Galatia, near the borders of the Tolistobogii kingdom. Since their settlement in the mid-3rd century, Galatia was divided in between three major tribes, the Tolistobogii, the Trachmi, and the Tectosages but they all chose to form an alliance in the face of a Roman invasion. In preparation for the incoming attack, the Tectosages occupied the mountain peak of Magaba, while the Tolistobogii and the warriors of the Trochmi fortified their position on Mount Olympus, Tataladai in the Antalya province of Turkey. The hope was that the rugged terrain would discourage the Romans from making an assault, but the consul was undeterred. After a few days of scouting the land and offering the appropriate sacrifices, Vulso ordered the ascent up Olympus in stages, attacking and pushing back any foes they came across. Roman legionaries eventually broke their way into the main encampment and set themselves upon the fleeing Galatians, many of whom fell to their deaths in pursuit. Livy states that 10,000 Celts were killed and another 40,000 were taken captive. Following the looting of the battlefield, Vulso was nearly killed in an unsuccessful negotiation with the Tectosages stationed on Mount Magaba. He was able to escape and regrouped with his army, now joined by the forces of Ariarathes of Cappadocia. A second battle of Magaba would prove to be the decisive blow to the Gallic resistance, as the Roman coalition stormed the mountain stronghold and showed little mercy. The treasure seized was apparently the communal stockpile from years of Galatian raids against their neighbors, and the Roman troops would go home well stocked. Envoys from the Tectosages appeared in front of Vulso requesting peace, and the consul demanded they sent officials to Ephesus, where he was to spend his winter quarters. They would arrive at the beginning of 188, and a treaty would end up being signed, not with the Roman Republic, but with King Eumenes instead. This was separate from the Peace of Apamea, which was ratified around the same time. With both treaties ratified, the consul brought his victorious army back across the Hellespont and into Europe, leaving Asia behind and laden with riches taken from the Seleucid and Gallic armies. Unfortunately, Vulso made two major errors. One was taking the overland route through Thrace in the middle of the summer heat without easily accessible drinking water, and the second was not informing King Philip in Macedonia of his crossing. Thracian raiders attacked the ill-organized Roman line almost the entire way to Greece, killing many in the process, but eventually they were able to make their way back to Illyria at the end of the year. Volso's war against the Galatians was a milestone in Roman history, not so much for the loot captured or the number of enemies taken in battle, but more so the conduct of its general. For the first time, a Roman commander waged war without consulting the Senate. Livy tells us through a series of largely rhetorical speeches that Vulso's request for a triumph was vehemently opposed by both the commission in Asia and the Senate. It circumvented the traditional protocol of Rome's institutions and laws, along with the risk of alienating the neighboring cities and kingdoms. For instance, the town of Gordium, of the Gordian knot fame, was sacked by his army despite offering no resistance, and the consul pressured many other communities for supplies and money. Vulso argued about the legality of attacking enemy that technically had not submitted for peace, but was not seen as especially persuasive. He still managed to get his triumph after his political allies were able to apply pressure on the Senate, so there was no real punishment for this act. It served as a dangerous precedent, though, where rogue commanders would begin to see the East as an opportunity to enrich themselves and their troops. 
Few expressed sympathy for the Gauls, though Polybius spoke highly about his meeting with a Galatian noblewoman named Kiomara, who took her revenge on the Centurion who ravished her while in captivity, and was viewed as a model of virtue by later authors. Following Vulso's return to Europe with army in tow, Rome had hoped that it would leave behind a stable framework to prevent them from being drawn back into the region. Unfortunately, Asia Minor would be racked with incessant warfare for the next ten years. In the partition of Antiochus's territories, Rome granted Eumenes the region of Mycia, which laid to the northeast of Pergamon, bordering the traditional lands of Bithynia. King Prusius had taken umbrage to this since Mysia was technically his property after he had seized it from Adelaide control in 190, and so Eumenes went to war with the Bithynian kingdom. Starting in 187, fighting between the two took place on both land and sea, but Eumenes initially carried the advantage. Evidently, Volso was not thorough enough in his campaign against the Galatians, for an ambitious prince of the Tolistobogii named Ortiagon, also allied with the Bithynians against Pergamon, perhaps hoping to unite all of Galatia under his rule with Prusius' assistance. Perhaps the Bithynian king could have kept his footing with the help of his new advisor, Hannibal Barca. In the wake of Magnesia, Hannibal took the opportunity to flee the court of Antiochus, if the king felt obliged to honor the terms of the peace which demanded that he be handed over. Our sources tell us that the Barca commander first sought asylum in the Cretan city of Gortina, but needed to escape when they plotted to deliver him to the Romans and steal this treasure that he brought. Roman tradition maintains that he also took refuge in the court of Artaxius I in Armenia, where he assisted in the construction of the king's new capital of Artaxacta. In 186, he headed west to Bithynia to offer his services to Prusius. Here he was settled in a town appropriately named Libyssa, but now he was called to war one last time. In a naval engagement, Hannibal commanded the Bithynian fleet and used an unorthodox strategy. Clay pots containing venomous snakes were lobbed onto the decks of the Pergamene ships, which caused the terrified sailors to sail back to camp, lest they try to avoid enemy fire and the bite of the deadly serpents. Though, one wonders how Hannibal managed to get the snakes in the pots to begin with. Despite the setback, Eumenes continued to press forward, managing to win a great land victory near Mount Lypedros over Prusius' army and his Galatian allies in 184, earning him the title of Soter. Negotiations were soon set up afterwards, with Rome sending Titus Quinctius Flamininus to oversee the process until its conclusion in 183. Obviously, a war involving their ally would be important to address, but Prusius's welcoming of Hannibal to his court did not endear him to the Romans either. Our sources are split on what happens next. In Plutarch's account, Flamininus, the conqueror of Philip, was still seized with unending ambition even after his past triumphs. The potential glory of delivering the Barca general in chains to the Senate was too enticing to ignore, and he pressured Prusius to give Hannibal up. Another view suggests that Prusius preemptively sold Hannibal out to try and get in the Republic's good graces. Either way, Hannibal would not let himself be taken alive. As Bithynian soldiers attempted to break into his home, the Punic commander pulled out a vial of poison, proclaiming, quote, Let us free the people of Rome from their lingering anxiety, since they find it too long a process to wait for an old man's death. Thus ended the life of Hannibal Barca at the age of 64, the implacable enemy of Rome who honored the vows promised to his father on the sacred altar all those decades ago. It was a sorry situation for a figure as monumental as he was. Plutarch saw it as a shameful affair and a stain on Flamininus's character, whose unending hunger for glory pushed him to drive a long-since-defeated old man to commit suicide. Though the war between Pergamon and Bithynia was at an end, peace still eluded Asia Minor. King Pharnaces I took the throne of Pontus around 190, and proved to be every bit as ambitious as his neighbors. In 183, he seized the city of Sinope on the Black Sea, an act that caused widespread outrage from his contemporaries and later authors. Rome received a whole host of embassies from Asia shortly afterwards, with Rhodes bringing charges of Pontic treachery to the Senate, and it seems that Pharnaces sent representatives to try and counter those claims. A Roman commission investigated the dispute and judged that Pharnaces was untrustworthy and rapacious. By the end of that year, 
the Mithridatid king seems to have invaded Galatia, Paphlagonia, and Cappadocia, effectively kicking off a new war. On one side was Eumenes, Ariarathes, and Prusias II, who took the throne upon his father's death in 183, all united against Pharnaces and his ally, Mithridates of Armenia. Information about this conflict is disjointed, but we have some sense of its key events. One of Pharnaces' generals named Leocritus occupied the city of Teos before moving into Galatia with 10,000 men to raid and pillage before attacking Cappadocia, seizing a large part of the Cappadocian treasury. Eumenes and his brother Atlas joined up forces with Ariarathes to counteract the Pontic army before being intercepted by Roman agents. Once again, the Republic attempted to intervene and sent commissioners to Asia to try and convince Pharnaces to come to the negotiating table, but he refused to budge their demands. Despite his confidence, the Mithridatid's luck seemed to have turned, and we find him in an increasingly vulnerable position in early 180. Eumenes set up a blockade at the Hellespont to prevent Pontic ships from providing assistance, though the Rhodians demanded that he cease his actions after some time, given their involvement in the Black Sea trade. Pergamene, Bithynian, and Cappadocian armies were putting on the pressure, and Pharnaces looked to his relatives Seleucus IV in Syria for help. The Seleucid king contemplated them whether to provide assistance given their shared ancestry, but ultimately decided against it to avoid violating the peace of Apamea. Without the possibility of reinforcements, the Pontic ruler relented and agreed to a peace treaty in late 180, early 179. A fragment of Polybius preserves its terms, which imposed several stipulations, including a hefty indemnity of 2,100 silver talents and the total abandonment of his conquests, bringing yet another war to a close. At the time of Rome's evacuation of Asia in 188, there were still matters of attention to address in Greece. Antiochus' most fervent supporters in Europe were the Aetolians, who by the beginning of 190 were surrounded by Romans and granted a six-month truce in order to conduct a peace with the Senate. The representatives sat in Rome waiting for an audience until the end of that year, but after delivering an unsatisfactory response after being kept on hold for so long, they were given 15 days to leave Italy lest they be treated as an enemy rather than ambassadors. They returned to Greece empty-handed, but the response enraged the Aetolians. By now, the war with Antiochus was almost over, but the Romans demanded the complete surrender of Aetolia. The Aetolians, meanwhile, had taken the opportunity to push into Athamania, which had been seized by Philip V who drove King Amenander and his family out of their capital during the conflict. Macedonian garrisons were evicted or slaughtered, and Amenander was restored to his throne. This left Aetolia in a more defensible position than it had been in the year prior, but the official announcement of Antiochus' surrender came with the news of a new Roman army in Greece. Marcus Fulvius Nobilior served as the co-consul alongside Manlius Vulso in 189, and he was handled the responsibility of finishing the war with Aetolia. After conferring with the Epirotes, Fulvius chose to lay siege to Ambracia, the largest city that was friendly to the Antolian cause. It proved to be an epic struggle as each side ferociously threw themselves into their work. Roman attempts to batter down the gates failed, as did the five siege towers placed around its walls. The tunnelers who tried to dig underneath the city faced an unusual countermeasure. A large pot fitted with an iron pipe was stuffed with smoldering charcoal and feathers, which created an acrid smoke that was pumped underground, forcing the Romans to flee their tunnels gasping for fresh air. For all the suffering of its inhabitants, the prospects of the Aetolians did not look good. Prince Perseus of Macedon was raiding Aetolian territory, as were the Illyrians under King Pleuratus. The League leadership realized that it could not sustain a three-front war for much longer, and chose to submit for peace one final time, rather than face annihilation. King Amenander managed to work out a deal with Fulvius to enter the city and encourage its citizens to surrender, on account of his long-time friendship with them, and they agreed to put down their arms against the Romans. As per the terms of the treaty, the Aetolians were to pay an indemnity of 500 talents, hand over any prisoners of war, provide hostages, and promise not to wage war against either Rome or her allies. Unlike Philip or Antiochus, 
one of the clauses explicitly demanded that the Aetolians submit to Roman authority. Though this is probably an attempt to account for the League's betrayal of their past alliance, compared to an enemy king. For his part, Fulvius allowed the surviving Aetolians to walk away from Ambracia back to their country, while his legionaries despoiled the city of most of its artwork. Having once been a palace of Pyrrhus of Epirus, it had quite a selection. Since its prestigious role in the defeat of the invading Gauls in 279, the Aetolian League had been a major player in the political landscape of Greece. Now they had been reduced by the Republic to a mere shell of their former status. Not eliminated outright, but never again would they play an active role in the affairs of the Greeks. Both Manius Asilius Glabrio, the commander who defeated Antiochus at Thermopylae and later trapped the Aetolians in Heraclea, and Fulvius, would celebrate their triumphs over the League. In a moment of delicious irony, Democritus, the Aetolian leader who promised to bring war to the banks of the Tiber River, would end up committing suicide along that same shoreline, attempting to escape his humiliation and Glabrio's triumph. The Aetolian League's submission meant that the war that dragged Rome back into Greece and Asia was now officially over. Trouble would continue to occupy the peninsula, however, thanks to the activities of the Achaean League. Dominating the political scene of Achaea were two men, Philippoamen of Megalopolis and Diophanes. We ought to be at least somewhat familiar with the former, his service to the League going back to the battles with King Cleomenes III. He has sporadically appeared in our narrative, assuming the mantle once held by Aratus of Sicyon as the chief figure of the Achaeans, reforming its army and demonstrating his skill as a commander in battles against the Aetolians and Spartans. Diophanes was his junior officer who was eventually elected as the new Strategos for 192-191, but the pair became political rivals. They agreed upon the expansion of Achaean power throughout the Peloponnese, yet Philippoamen was far more reluctant to work with the Roman Republic. During the earliest stages of the war against Antiochus, Philippoamen invaded the lands of Sparta following the murder of its last king, Navis, and forcibly enrolled the city into the League in 192. Many Spartans were deeply unhappy about this arrangement, though, recognizing that their independence was now virtually at an end. Salt was rubbed in the wound by the handling of the Lacedaemonian exiles, who were eager to be brought back into the fold after decades of civil unrest. Philippoamen was delaying the process until it was better suited for his interests, to the fear of the citizens of Sparta. It's not made clear why the Spartans were uncomfortable with their return, but chances are they dreaded the strife that would break out when the exiles tried to reclaim their formerly vacant properties that were bought or seized in their absence. 191 saw a small rebellious movement that prompted Diophanes to march upon Laconia with the assistance of Flamininus. Philippoamen intervened on behalf of the Spartans and barred the city gate shut against the combined force until a peaceful solution could be found, or at least one that didn't interfere with the arrangement that he had made the year prior. Despite Flamininus' earlier attempts to aggressively intervene, Spartan embassies were instead sent to Rome for arbitration. Hostages taken after the war with Nabis were released on the Senate's orders in 190, but they did not address the restoration of the exiles or issues regarding lost territory. At this point, the Spartans felt cornered, and so they made the unwise decision to launch an attack against the town of Las along the Peloponnesian coastline, where many of the exiles then resided. This was in direct violation of the Achaean truce which prohibited Sparta from taking such offensive measures or attempting to gain access to the ports of Laconia. As Strategos for 189, Philippoamen sent envoys to Sparta demanding an explanation and the surrender of the officials who authorized it. The Spartans responded violently in turn, executing those loyal to the Achaean cause, publicly renouncing their membership to the League, and sent an urgent request to the consul Marcus Fulvius requesting that they be placed under the protection of Rome. Fulvius hosted a conference in the winter of 189-188 to try and reconcile the two parties. Yet the consul's response seemed remarkably neutral or even disinterested. Both sides, therefore, saw it as the justification they needed to prosecute the war. In the spring, Achaean raids penetrated Laconia and prompted the Spartans to try and surrender the officials that attacked Las. Some of the exiles were brought to the exchange by the Achaeans, and a fight quickly broke out and escalated into a massacre. The city was now undefended, and the Achaeans then took it by storm. Philippoamen's previous goodwill was now gone, and he dealt with his rebellion in a far more brutal fashion than 192. 
over 80 Spartans were executed and another 3,000 sold into slavery. Parts of Laconia were given control of Megalopolis. Sparta's walls were torn down, and the Lycurgan constitution was abolished. No more Spartiates were enrolled in the traditional agoge, instead being educated like other Achaean nobles. Thus did Philippoemon decisively bring Spartan power to an end, once and for all. Sparta's combative nature had done little to win the friendship of its neighbors across the Peloponnese, but their historical reputation gave them a begrudging degree of respect from even their enemies. Their treatment by the Achaean commander was not seen favorably by contemporaries nor future generations. The consul of 187, Marcus Lepidus, wrote a letter expressing his disapproval over Philippoemon's behavior, an opinion shared by the Senate as well, despite their unwillingness to intervene. Plutarch saw it as Philippoemon's greatest moral failure but Polybius claimed it to be a justified act in order to keep the Spartans in line. Achaean domination over the Peloponnese was uncontested at this point. However, some of our ancient sources characterize the period following the war against Antiochus as one of growing tension between the Achaean League and the Roman Republic. The partnership formed during the Second Macedonian War had been convenient for both sides, with Rome achieving its ends and asserting a degree of peace, and Achaea acquiring much more power and influence at the expense of its rivals in Sparta and Aetolia. Yet it seems that there was a debate regarding how much sway the Senate should hold when it came to dictating the affairs of Greece. Leading Achaean statesmen like Diophanes and Aristanus were more receptive to Roman involvement, whereas Philippoemon and his protege Lycortas of Megalopolis pushed against it. Philippoemon's enrollment of Sparta into the League had gone against the wishes of Flamininus, who was still Rome's key agent in Greece, as was the later dismantling of its constitution and the handling of their exiles. Sometime between 189 and 187, Flamininus attempted to restore a Boeotian exile named Zeuxippus, who was involved in the murder of the pro-Macedonian official Brachyles, and called upon the Achaeans to assist in the process. Philippoemen sent a message to the Boeotian leadership to listen to Rome's request, but subsequently caused a conflict between the parties as an excuse to seize Boeotian property, and Zeuxippus was forgotten. In another incident, Plutarch claims that when Diophanes purchased from an ex-employee of King Amenander the island of Zacynthus, located in the Ionian Sea, a distinctively Roman domain, Flamininus made a discouraging remark, explaining, quote, You'll be in danger, like the tortoise, if you poke your head out beyond the Peloponnese. The commander's witty remark may have been a warning, but the Achaeans were allowed to keep the island without further contest. Most of the decisions made by the League really did not get too much, if any, pushback from the Senate. They may have flexed their authority in response to Achaean activities that they deemed to be unbecoming, but this rarely, if ever, extended beyond a verbal chastisement. The League also made several independent treaties with various Hellenistic rulers, such as Ptolemy V Epiphanes, Eumenes of Pergamon, and even Seleucus IV. Such arrangements would continue as the Spartan question remained a topic of discussion for the next few years. Between 185 and 182, multiple delegations from Laconia made their way to Rome to try and restore what was left of their dignity under Achaean rule. Various committees proposed different solutions to the reorganization of Sparta, but it was an impotent effort that was only half-heartedly taken up by agents of the Republic. Circumstances were different, though, when it came to the city of Messene. In 183, the Messenian leader Dinocrates tried to meet with Flamininus before he departed for Bithynia, hoping to curry his favor and gain the sponsorship of their defection from the Achaean League. Though a longtime rival of Sparta, they too seemed to have been dissatisfied with the Achaean hegemony over the Peloponnese. Flamininus called for an assembly to discuss the matter, but nothing came of it as the Achaeans refused the request and the proprietor made his way to Asia. Lack of Roman support notwithstanding, Dinocrates kickstarted the revolt later that year. Philippoemon and the other Achaean leaders were infuriated by this betrayal, but a commissioner named Quintus Martius Philippus was en route to Macedonia when he advised the League not to take any actions against Messini before the Senate made decision. This was ignored, much to the commissioner's annoyance, and war was declared against the Messinians. The Republic refused to become involved when the Achaeans sent a mission requesting military aid. The Achaeans were but one of many who sent representatives in 183 calling for Roman intervention, and the Senate was growing increasingly frustrated, 
especially considering that the Achaeans ignored the commissioner Philippus' earlier advice. The secession of members from the League was not a high priority to the Senate, who outright stated that they just did not care. With this rejection, the Achaean League took the opportunity to move against Messene. By now, Philip Hoeman was 70 years old, and serving his eighth term as Strategos. His constitution may have not been that of a young man, but he nevertheless was driven to lead the Achaeans with the same focus and vigor as he had always done. He and Lycortas marched to Messenian territory and met with the forces of Dinocrates in battle. The main body of the Messenians were driven off by the League, but Philip Hoeman and his squadron of cavalry were caught off guard by the arrival of reinforcements. He managed to hold his position against his opponents as the Achaean horsemen were able to escape one at a time, but the general was forced to ride into rough terrain by missile attacks and thrown off his mount headfirst into the ground. Severely dazed and wounded, Philip Poeman was taken captive by the Messenians and brought back to their city in chains. Plutarch tells us that the citizenry of Messene was anything but celebratory, quickly feeling pity for the man who once rescued them from the tyranny of novice. Dinocrates sensed that the public's opinion was turning, so he imprisoned Philip Poeman in a cramped and dingy cavern underneath the city's treasury. During the dark of night, a slave was sent to the cell of the old warrior bearing a cup of poison. Philip Hoeman merely asked his executioner if his men had escaped unharmed from the battlefield, and after giving reassurance that they did, he calmly drank the fatal concoction and slipped into the eternal sleep. So ended the life of Philip Hoeman, but Dinocrates was not to have the last laugh. News of their beloved hero's capture and execution enraged the Achaeans, who enthusiastically volunteered in great numbers to take their revenge. Lycortus ordered the ravaging of the Mycenaean countryside until they received word that the citizens had turned against the city's leadership, delivering many of the secessionists into Achaean hands. All except for Dinocrates, that is, who escaped punishment by taking his own life. After cremating his body, Philip Hoeman's ashes were brought back to Megalopolis and interred during a magnificent public funeral, attended by the League's most prominent members and citizens. Most notable was Lycortus's son, the future historian Polybius, who was given the honor of carrying the urn of his idol to its final resting place. To many, the death of Philip Hoeman was a watershed moment in the history of Greece. Compared to Aratus of Sicyon, Philip Hoeman has appeared quite infrequently in our story, but his reputation endeared him far longer to both his friends and even his political enemies. Greek authors saw the Achaean general as the last brilliant spark of an independent Greece before the Roman conquest, comparing him favorably to past heroes like Themistocles. Pausanias even goes so far to claim that from that point on, Greece ceased to bear good men. Plutarch is more critical, seeing his downfall tied to his own pride and poor treatment of the Spartans, but still celebrated the Achaean leader as a model of virtue whose deeds were more noble than that of Flamininus his Roman biographical counterpart. Quote, so Titus's generous and caring deeds towards the Greeks were noble, but Philippoman's deeds towards the Romans, harsh and hard-headed as they were in their pursuit of freedom, were nobler still, for it is easier to give favors to those who want them than to resist and cause pain to those more powerful to oneself. While events in Greece and Asia were transpiring, there were affairs in Italy itself that showed the impact of the various wars the Republic had been embroiled in. If there was anyone to be riding high in 187, it ought to have been the Scipios. Publius Scipio Africanus' reputation already preceded him, but the newly christened Lucius Scipio Asiaticus delivered the final blow to Antiochus at Magnesia, and elevated the family's prestige. Lucius celebrated his triumph over Antiochus in 189, which reportedly carried an even greater volume of plunder than the one held by his brother after the defeat of Carthage. However, in 187, a lawsuit was brought to the Senate issued by the Quintii Patelli, cousins and acting tribunes of the plebs, charging Lucius Scipio Asiaticus on the grounds of corruption. The sequence thereafter is horribly confused in our sources, but it appears that the tribunes had ample evidence, or so they claimed, which led them to believe that Lucius did not deposit all the money paid up by Antiochus into the state treasury, 
an act that could constitute embezzlement. When Scipio Africanus's son was captured, Antiochus unsuccessfully tried to bribe the commander with the freedom of his boy and a large cash payment in return for peace. This was followed by a 3,000 talent payment during the ratification process of the Treaty of Apamea, which apparently was not considered part of the indemnity owed to the state, but as booty for the Scipio brothers to distribute to their army. It seems that the actions of the tribunes were motivated by the influence of Marcus Portius Cato, better known as Cato the Elder or Cato the Censor, who by now had earned a reputation for his conservatism and hatred for all things luxury. This extended to Scipio Africanus, the poster child for his grievances. Scipio had eschewed the traditional protocol during the Second Punic War to take command, which could be excused given the extreme situation after Hannibal massacred much of the Roman nobility, but he was also characteristically ostentatious in his displays and was an open philhellene, which Cato was not especially fond of. While the attitudes regarding Hellenism in the Roman Republic is something I want to save for a later time, we can certainly say that it was approaching a level of change that was unprecedented by the end of the 180s. In all likelihood, the antagonism between both men was probably due more to political rivalries than differences in taste. Competition was always a key feature of the aristocracy, be it on the field of battle or on the senate floor, but the prestige and power of Scipio was unparalleled thanks to his successes in Spain, Africa, and now Asia. To Cato, a man with such clout was a major threat to the founding principles of the Republic, which in his eyes started to show signs of moral degeneration thanks in large part to the influx of booty from the East. Since Manlius Vulso was already placed under heavy scrutiny for his behavior in Galatia, the opportunity to crack down hard on the Scipios was too convenient to pass up. Scipio defended Lucius against the accusations, going so far as to tear up the record books of his campaigns in full view of his fellow senators, and angrily chastise him for being so fixated on the whereabouts of 3,000 talents that were taken as plunder. Meanwhile, Seleucid silver was being delivered to the treasury each year in great quantities without question. Despite the appeals, Lucius was convicted of the charges and ordered to pay a heavy fine or be imprisoned for his actions. Instead of suffering this indignity, a tribune named Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus stepped forward and intervened on behalf of Asiaticus, able to secure the freedom of the ex-consul. Cato remained undeterred, stripping Lucius of his equestrian rights and soundly defeating him in the elections for censor in 184. The attacks on the Scipios continued, and while Lucius was the target in 187, Scipio Africanus faced similar charges a few years later. On the day of his defense, Scipio was escorted to the forum by an enormous crowd of supporters and refused to give a direct response against his accusers. Instead, he reminded everyone present that it was on this same date years earlier that he defeated Hannibal Barca at Zama and delivered victory to the Republic, then promptly excused himself to conduct sacrifices and return home. Without sufficient evidence, and a lack of willingness to convict him, Scipio was acquitted. Despite being exonerated of all charges, the lawsuits left Scipio Africanus deeply embittered, believing that he had been abandoned by the very same people he had saved from the Carthaginian menace. He entered a voluntary self-exile during the final years of his life, preferring to spend time at his villa in Laternum near modern Naples. There he had contracted some sort of illness and would die in 183 ironically, the same year as his great rival Hannibal Barca. Valerius Maximus claims that Scipio immortalized his resentment by ordering an inscription be placed upon his tomb, which read, quote, Ungrateful country, you do not even have my bones. End quote. Despite the disgrace suffered by the two brothers, the Scipios would remain one of Rome's most influential families in the decades to come. Following his defense of Lucius Scipio, Gracchus was wed to Cornelia Africana, the daughter of Scipio Africanus and one of the most remarkable women of the day. Their union eventually produced the famed brothers Gracchi, who in turn would shake the foundations of the Republic. In the meanwhile, they strengthened their relationship to the house of the Emilii Paulii, with whom Africanus seems to have close ties since the Second Punic War. Its patriarch Lucius Aemilius Paulus, brother to Scipio Africanus's wife, Aemilia Tertia, would lead the final campaigns in Macedonia. Africanus's eldest son Publius ended up adopting one of Paulus's boys, the future Scipio Aemilianus, and the final arbitrator over the fate of Carthage. 
In a very short window of time, the Mediterranean world lost three of its most important commanders, Scipio Africanus, Hannibal Barca, and Philip Hoeman. We also lose track of Flamininus at this time as well. Following his role in Hannibal's demise, he does not seem to have carried any more post of distinction until his own death in 174. Since Hannibal's attack on the city of Saguntum in 218, the Mediterranean had undergone a remarkable transformation across 40 years. In quick succession, the Roman Republic managed to establish supremacy over Carthage, Antigone Macedon, and the Seleucid Empire. Places like Spain, North Africa, Greece, and Asia Minor now fell into the Roman sphere of influence. Polybius refers to this phenomenon as simploche, an interconnectedness where the events on one end directly impact the affairs on the other, all bound together by the power of the Republic, and it is one of the central theses of his histories. Through the lens of international relations, this can be described as a state of unipolarity. Where there had once been many strong kingdoms where no one power completely dominated, there was now a clear hierarchy, with one key force at the top. As we have discussed to death and back over the past several episodes, there have been multiple explanations behind Rome's rise to the status of a superpower. Some claim that the Republic was exceptionally militaristic compared to its neighbors, who were the victims of calculated Roman imperialism. Others suggest that the ancient Mediterranean was an inherently predatory and brutal environment, where all players big and small were extremely aggressive towards one another. My opinion leans towards the latter explanation. Time and time again, the Republic demonstrates a deep reluctance to establish any permanent presence outside of Italian soil, particularly in the Greek East. They voluntarily elected to withdraw all troops from Greece and Asia Minor as soon as the opportunity presented itself. When issues arose in their absence, this policy continued. The year 183 was remarkable for the sheer number of embassies dispatched to Rome from all over the East. Messini, Achaea, Sparta, Pergamon, Pontus, and Rhodes, all requesting aid for various issues. None of them were met with a military response. The Senate instead chose to send out individual agents to merely investigate or facilitate discussion without taking firm action. Local leaders were entrusted by the Republic to continue governing themselves with relatively little oversight, so long as it did not rock the boat too much. The Achaean League and Pergamon took the opportunity to greatly expand their power against their neighbors independent of Roman influence, in some cases going completely against the wishes of the Senate without incurring punishment. Even those they had forced to submit to Roman authority by arms, such as Philip V of Macedon, were allowed to keep their position or even rewarded for good behavior, much to the protestation of their allies. The Republic certainly imposed harsh terms on their defeated enemies, but nothing that is exceptionally cruel. Given that Philip V and Antiochus III were the chief aggressors in their respective conflicts, it was only reasonable that they should pay for all of Rome's war expenses. Outside of Greece and Asia, there were other elements at play. When one thinks of a Roman strategy for building their empire, it seems rather surprising that the Republic had yet to establish complete control over the entirety of the Italian peninsula before engaging in their wars against Carthage and the Hellenistic kingdoms. As I mentioned earlier, the Po Valley was not fully pacified until the 190s, after their conquest over the remaining Celtic tribes in the area. It might well be argued that Italy would not be completely Roman until the conclusion of the Social War and the enrollment of its Latin allies as citizens during the early 1st century BC. Marcellus's capture of Syracuse in 212 saw the wholesale incorporation of Sicily under Roman jurisdiction. They had already established control over a large portion of the island in the wake of the First Punic War, but the collapse of the Syracusan monarchy once held by Hero II made their decision for them. Since the expulsion of Carthaginian troops by Scipio Africanus in 206, a Roman military presence remained in the Iberian Peninsula. Originally, it was meant to deter a renewed Punic attack in the area. But following the end of the war, there was active fighting between the legions and the Celtiberian communities almost every year thereafterwards until the 170s. Two new provinces were therefore established in 198, Hispania Caterior and Hispania Ulterior but the conflicts here demanded considerable attention and manpower. This may have been a byproduct of the fragile alliances formed between the Scipios and local chieftains, but there are hints of a developing interest in the exploitation of silver mines during the campaigns of Cato the Elder. Still, 
there was no highly developed administrative structure put in place as of yet. Even accounting for Rome's extraordinary military capabilities, the decades of campaigning on multiple fronts were incredibly taxing, and explains the overall reluctance to commit to anything akin to imperialist expansion. But throughout this period, we have seen some worrying developments concerning the broader history of Rome. Championed as a model system of government by Polybius, the Republic saw few incidences of large-scale civil unrest since its traditional founding date of 509 BC. Yet there does seem to be a marked change in the behavior of the Roman aristocracy at this time. Competition among the senatorial class has always been a key feature of its history, and arguably one part of its recipe for success. Men were eager to prove themselves on the field of battle or in the Senate House, to acquire the glory and elevate the honor of their family above their peers. A number of safeguards were put in place to always keep these ambitions from extending too far, but the Second Punic War may have changed this. Hannibal's victories at Trebia, Trasimene, and especially Cannae completely devastated the demographics of the nobility. Opportunities for less distinguished families looking to make their mark opened up, often circumventing the standard protocols as the need for commanders to fill the ranks in across the many theaters of war were more pressing. This resulted in the rise of highly influential figures whose authority extended far beyond the Italian peninsula, uh, most prominently seen with Scipio Africanus. Others, such as Titus Quinctius Flamininus, also took the forefront thanks to their success abroad. One way to gain popularity was the acquisition and distribution of wealth to the citizens of Rome. Naturally, warfare was a good way to get your hands on plunder, and the East was wealthy indeed. The wars against Philip V, Antiochus III, Aetolia, and the Galatians saw tens of thousands of pounds of gold and hundreds of thousands of pounds of silver presented in the triumphs of its victorious generals. A fair amount of this was paid out to their soldiers and the general public, or used to fund public work projects that would elevate the reputation of its patrons. Syracuse's capture and sack by the forces of Marcellus brought home innumerable works of Greek art, as would the cities taken in Greece during the wars against the Antigonids and Seleucids, such as the aforementioned Ambracia. These pieces now adorn the many mansions of the capital, appealing to the ever-increasing Philhellenic tastes of the Romans, and to the dismay of the observing Greeks. Eager for glory and riches, Gnaeus Manlius Vulso undertook his predatory campaign against the Galatians in 189, and for the first time in its history, a Roman commander had operated without gaining the authorization of the Roman Senate. Vulso was certainly prosecuted for this behavior and barely gained a triumph, but the precedent was now set. Those who were ambitious enough could view the eastern Mediterranean as a way to enrich themselves and gain power. This would have dire consequences when it came to the time of the late Republic, where figures like Sulla, Gnaeus Pompey, Lucullus, and others operated on a much more destructive scale. Such behaviors would begin to rear the ugly heads as the decades went on, but for now, the Republic sat comfortably with two decades of peace, in the loosest sense of the term preventing the need for them to return to Greece and Asia. During the wars against Prusius and Pharnaces, the second half of the 180s saw disturbing news come from Roman allies, warning the Republic of the actions of King Philip in Macedon. After honoring the peace of 197 for over 15 years, those like Eumenes and the Achaean League claimed that Philip was secretly rebuilding his nation to launch a new war against the Republic and restore the Antigonid hegemony over Greece. At the head of a united household with his adult sons Demetrius and Perseus, the once subdued king could potentially endanger the peace that the Republic had spent so long trying to enforce. <laughs> <laughs>